Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, James Smith. I'm the Vice Principal International of the University of Edinburgh. I'm really delighted to welcome people to the ninth Leventis Conference. Uh, we are, of course, extremely grateful to the Leventis Foundation for their continued support, and I'd like in particular to welcome Professor Konstantinosis Christofides, Rector of the University of Cyprus, who is one of the Foundation's representatives here today. I know there's, there's several people here representing the Foundation. The, the, the Leventis Foundation was established in 1979 as a result of provisions made by Anastasios Leventis in his will. Uh, from the beginning, the Foundation has aimed to support educational, cultural, artistic and philanthropic courses in Cyprus, Greece and elsewhere. In 1997, the Foundation endowed a chair for a visiting research professorship in classical Greece to be based in classics. The purpose of this chair is to contribute to the understanding of classical Greece, its literature, people and history. One of the main responsibilities of the professor whilst in residence is to arrange a conference resulting in publication and this is why we find ourselves here today. The Foundation has continued to support classics in Edinburgh, most recently with the creation of the A.G. Leventis Chair in Byzantine Studies. The first holder of this chair, Professor Niels Gall, took up his position just this September. This year's Leventis Visiting Professor of Greek is the established, distinguished historian of classical Greece, <coughs> Professor Josiah Ober of Stanford. He has taken as his theme ancient Greek history and contemporary social science. There's a long history of, a of successful engagement between social sciences and classical studies. Social science has been a source of new and productive approaches to understanding ancient Greece, while classical Greek history and culture has been a touchstone for social theorists since the 19th century. More recently, the use of quantitative methods and formal theory, drawn from contemporary political science, economics and sociology, have led to a new understanding of ancient Greek economic and political development. This is something exemplified by Josh, J Josiah Ober's latest book, The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece. This conference aims to bring together Hellenists interested in the potential of contemporary social science methods with social scientists with a strong inter interest in ancient Greece. Jos Ober is one of the world's leading ancient historians. He's the Konstantin Mitsakakis Professor of Political Science and Classics at Stanford University. He previously spent 16 years at Princeton. His work ranges widely over history, politics, and ethics. Indeed, he has just returned from giving the Seeley Lectures in Cambridge, where his theme was democracy before liberalism, something he continues in his opening lecture here today for this conference, Greek History and Social Science, a Test Case, Democracy Before Liberalism. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for being here and welcome uh, Josiah Ober to give his lecture now. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question one might ask um, uh, of the theme of this conference uh, is why should we be bothering um, to think about uh, Greek history and social science, except that you're here and you probably already think that they are, do belong together. But if we were going to persuade someone who didn't happen to be in this room, um, uh, uh, what would we say? Uh, and I think that um, uh, we could say that Greek history um, is of value because it is an ideal proving ground for putting together normative approaches to social science with positive approaches to social science. So thinking about um, uh, uh, the ways in which norms and the ways in which descriptive uh, social science can come together in one place. It offers us a chance um, uh, to test um, uh, out of sample, currently debated uh, theories, causal theories, as well as normative theories, um, about things that social scientists care about. For example, democracy, economic development, uh, authoritarianism, impact of social networks. Um, and I've already been doing some work, especially um, with my colleagues, uh, uh, Federica Caragatti, uh, now at uh, uh, in Indiana University, and Barry Weingast uh, uh, at uh, Stanford. Um, so there's lots of work that we can show you if you're uh, uh, interested that follows uh, uh, the, the ideas that are, are going to be presented here very briefly tonight. Night. Um, so contemporary uh, theories of politics, this is the idea of normative together with positive um, uh, social science, contemporary theories of poli uh, politics tend to be either normative or positive. So about values or about facts, about ought 
driven, um, what ought to be the case in a certain set of social relations, uh, as opposed to is, what is the case um, in a certain set of social relations. About moral requirement, what um, uh, is your duty, your moral duty, or about causal explanation, why does something happen, why, uh, what is the relationship between one set of phenomena uh, and another set of phenomena. Um, uh, focusing on progress towards an ideal or at least a better society as opposed to thinking about uh, equilibrium solutions, whether those are stable equilibria um, or dynamic equilibria. So there's this divergence um, uh, in social science between um, these two sort of uh, realms of, uh, of doing things realms of thinking about society. Now, theories of politics um, uh, and various other aspects of social order from Greek antiquity, um, uh, beginning with Plato, Aristotle, but back to Thucydides, even arguably back to Homer, up to the 19th century, at least in the Atlantic tradition, um, were often both normative and positive. So put together value and fact, uh, ought and is, moral admonition and causal explanation, a focus on progress and a focus on equilibrium solutions. So if we think of the work of Plato or Aristotle, Hobbes, Hume, Montesquieu, Madison, Mill, and so on, to ask, is that thinker a normative thinker or are they interested in descriptive facts, understanding society as it really is? Wouldn't make sense. They're interested in both. Um, uh, and so uh, the thought is, is that at least the idea that these things come together was coherent to a very long tradition of thinking about society. So why don't we do that today? Uh, why have we decided to break these out? Um, well, sure, um, uh, today uh, in modern disciplines, we tend to break everything up. So there's a lot of disciplinary siloing um, in the modern academy. But I think there's a more particular reason for this, and that is uh, what uh, I guess is, uh, I would call an apparent and momentary pause um, in a long era um, that certainly stretches back to the ancient Greece and forward um, into the 19th century of high stakes politics, in which politics really meant something um, uh, in terms of uh, people's likelihood of survival. Um, contemporary social science and analytic liberalism came together um, in an age after um, the Second World War in which it appeared that the stakes of politics had gone down, at least for people in the highly developed West, right? We were now, we'd, we'd solved the um, uh, catastrophes um, of the 20th century and now um, the, the stakes of politics were relatively um, lower. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, base my argument on three premises, and I'm not going to argue for these. I'm happy to talk about them in the, in the Q&A. Um, first is a factual and predictive premise. That is, the era of low-stakes politics regarded as simply the new normal. This is the way the world is now. Everything has changed. Um, uh, was historically atypical. Um, it was an artifact of um, uh, a generation after the Second World War, and it's not likely to recur. Um, the stakes of politics have gone up again, so I assert, and will stay uh, pretty high uh, for as long as we're likely to be worrying about it. That's the first premise. The second is a normative premise that lowering the stakes of politics where and when possible is desirable. It's not nice to have to worry about survival all the time, right? So um, to bring the stakes down is good. And the third is methodological, um, and that is addressing social problems that arise in an era of high stakes politics in which politics really matters for people's survival um, requires both normative and positive theory. And and that that's basically why all of these people, these great thinkers who lived in the high stakes era before the Second World War did address these things together is because that's the way to think about it. If you want a better world, you have to think about how the world um, uh, actually came to be as it is. So uh, it's a kind of a back to the future moment then. If my premises are correct, then people who care about 
problems of social order, and let's say at least the people in this room, and hopefully a whole lot of other people, um, uh, uh, really have to uh, have a moment in which we can begin to think about why it was the way people thought about things for a long time, normative and positive together, uh, why is it perhaps um, uh, the future of how we should be thinking about things. Now, there are many pasts that could be relevant to the problems of a readily imagined high stakes future, um, but so I'll claim the ancient Greek past can make a special claim on our attention. So I'm not saying that ancient Greece is the only way to think about um, the way in which normative and positive issues can come together um, to help us think about uh, uh, the world we're in and that we might end up in, um, but Greece, I think, um, is really worthwhile um, on, its own, uh, on its own terms. Why is that? Um, because it offers, Greece offers opportunities for a genuine out-of-sample test of some social theories um, that address problems that are at the very center of the social science agenda. Uh, for example, democracy. Now, um, just these are two issues that I've been very interested in. They're not the, all of the things that um, social scientists are or should be interested in. But democracy, so how does it come about? How does it arise? How is it sustained? Um, economic growth or decline. Why do some places see dramatic and sustained growth? Other places simply don't. Other places see um, spurts of growth uh, followed by uh, a quick uh, decline. Well, ancient Greece is good for studying both those problems and arguably a number of other problems that really matter um, to social science. It's good for doing this kind of theory testing because it's comparatively data rich. Now, we ancient historians tend to spend a lot of time bemoaning the fact that we know so little about our topic. Uh, uh, gee, there's so much has been lost. And of course, a great deal has been lost, but an awful lot is known. Uh, the ancient Greek world has been intensely studied um, uh, for many generations uh, by really smart people. Uh, and so we really know an awful lot about the ancient Greek world compared to most other um, ancient societies. Uh, and there have been recent comprehensive collections of evidence, um, uh, especially by the uh, great um, uh, Copenhagen um, uh, Polis Center, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, with, along with some colleagues at Stanford, um, we've uh, digitized in with the uh, blessing of the Copenhagen Center, or its founder anyway, um, uh, in ways that are available to you. So if you're interested in the data that lies behind some of the claims I'm going to make, um, go to that uh, uh, website, just uh, uh, Google um, Polis and Stanford together. It'll get you there, um, and you can check all of the uh, numbers that I throw out. So, um, uh, so uh, there's a lot of indigenous social theory for the Greek world compared to other pre-modern societies. So think about Thucydides or Plato or Aristotle. They are theorists of social um, uh, relations, uh, theorists uh, who offer you a way in which people at the time tried to explain to themselves uh, how their society worked uh, and also were interested in um, uh, how their society might be um, either made better um, or might, uh, if things go bad, uh, be made worse. Uh, it's a very, it offers a very diverse world, a thousand plus uh, city-states that is, on the one hand, um, uh, homogeneous um, uh, in geography, climate, um, language, religion, and so we can hold a lot of variables constant. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we have many different states with different regimes, with different local histories. Uh, so it's a, a very nice testing ground for social theories because it's both diverse and homogeneous. Um, and the key thing, and this is the out of sample test question, um, uh, it's not um, the, where the social theories that are being worried about by contemporary social scientists were developed initially. Most of the theories of, that contemporary social scientists are worried about were developed based on observations of the modern world, um, uh, especially the world since 1945, but um, perhaps going back as late as the um, uh, uh, early 20th century, occasionally dipping back into the 19th century. Um, but the problem is, is if you develop a theory um, based on um, uh, observations in a particular sample, say modernity, and then you want to test the validity of that 
theory, and you test it against the same sample, uh, you have this problem of confounding variables. There are things that are unique to antiquity um, that fall outside of issues that most social scientists are concerned with in terms of coming up for explanations for change. So he's talking about, you know, well, how does democracy affect economic change or vice versa? Um, uh, but gee, how about the, the scientific revolution? Well, maybe that's just what's doing all the work uh, in the background. Um, gee, the invention, the discovery of the new world, maybe that's what was in the background doing all the work. We can test these theories about relationships between, for example, democracy and economic change on the Greek world that didn't have the scientific revolution, right? didn't discover the new world. right? So it's an out-of-sample test uh, for um, uh, the various theories that really matter. You know, that are the theories that are the basis of the policy that are really either making people's lives better or making them worse, right? The, the social theories are what social policy gets built on. And so uh, if social theory is bad, um, policy is likely to be bad. So this really matters. Um, uh, a Greek history um, can uh, uh, really, I think, offer something that really matters to people um, and should matter to people in the real world even people who just don't happen to think Greece is as ex intrinsically fascinating as most of the people in this room know that it is, right? But this is a way that we can um, talk with people who don't already believe that to be the case. Okay, so I'm gonna give an example of um, uh, doing, using Greece as a test. Um, uh, and this is the project I've been working on, Democracy Before Liberalism. Um, the basic issue here is that because modern democracy tends to be liberal democracy, there's a great deal of confusion among social scientists, among political theorists, among policymakers about what democracy actually is um, and about what it is good for um, because it simply gets um, uh, tangled together uh, with liberalism. I think this is a problem for scholarship and it's a problem for real people in the real world because a lot of policy, I think, could be much better if it actually got clearer about what democracy is and about what liberalism is and what uh, is the same and what is different about those things. American policy since 2001, uh, foreign policy I think has been not what it should be, um, to be blunt. Um, uh, and uh, I think at least some of the problems in American foreign policy arise from a failure to understand um, uh, the democracy as a social system. So uh, challenges to the idea of thinking about democracy outside of liberalism or before liberalism, because that's what we're doing. We have our out-of-sample test. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes um, uh, said basically that, look, democracy just simply is majority tyranny. And you know, most people think, well, if it's majority tyranny, I, it doesn't sound so great. Why do I even want to study this thing? Um, uh, uh, the early modern liberal regimes um, are basically premised on the idea that democracy is only possible in limited small republics that um, early modern thinkers thought were pretty unstable, um, uh, premised on the idea that the stabilizing factor in um, 18th, 17th and 18th century nation states and forward is actually liberal institutions, not democracy, not collective self-governance by citizens. Um, uh, and contemporary liberal, liberal, liberal theorists that are saying, well, I, what? Um, uh, isn't democracy liberal? Um, so they the, the very problem of uh, disentangling them, uh, uh, these things. So I have to be able to answer those challenges. Um, uh, I think the challenges can be answered in part by um, history. Uh, we can show that democracy, of a sort anyway, um, does antedate uh, liberalism. Um, and furthermore, uh, democracy, I will claim, has an equilibrium solution. That is, it can be stable within a population of self-interested um, uh, persons uh, in a way that liberalism does not have uh, an equilibrium solution. Why doesn't liberalism have an equilibrium solution? I think there may be technical answers to that, but partly it's because liberal theorists were not terribly interested in finding one. After all, it's 1945 um, and past. The world is pretty stable where we care about it. We don't need to worry about equilibrium. We need to worry about justice. Um, uh, so uh, my argument is that democracy, once we understand what it really is, can provide a 
social political foundation for either a liberal or a non-liberal regime. Um, uh, and this is the way uh, we might think about its relationship to um, uh, uh, policy. Um, basic democracy, which is what I, the kind of democracy I'm thinking about, it doesn't have lots of features of liberal democracy, um, is an answer to the general question, how can we, whoever we are, right, some we, the people in some uh, state, let us say, cooperate at scale? That's the basic problem of social order. How can we cooperate? Um, so uh, if the general question um, is how can a human community um, uh, find ways to cooperate so that it is reasonably secure and it can gain the benefits of uh, social cooperation. Um, the special form of that question about cooperation, how can we cooperate, um, uh, is how can we do it without being ruled over by a master, without tyranny, um, so that uh, uh, without being ruled over by one individual or um, one subset um, of those uh, who might be imagined as potential citizens in our um, state. So democracy claims to be the answer to that question. It's the answer to how can you have um, uh, a, uh, a cooperation without a master. Um, but how is it uh, uh, the answer, and why is it the answer? Why is it not majoritarian tyranny, right? Why isn't Hobbes right? Um, uh, and why should we worry about citizen democracy if liberal institutions are actually the answer to what brings uh, stability uh, for modern nation states? Okay, so we need to go back to the beginning to begin to think about this. Um, uh, cooperation in very small groups. Um, so uh, uh, in, you think about most of human history, um, uh, uh, humans lived in very small groups, a few dozen people, um, uh, foraging societies uh, uh, until the development of agriculture. Um, those societies were, as anthropologists um, uh, are generally agreed, basically democratic uh, in that nobody really ran it. It was, there wasn't some um, uh, maximum leader who gave everybody uh, orders. Um, uh, so democracy turns out to be pretty easy in the kind of environment in which our kind of being evolved, right? Uh, so we have a kind of a natural default for that. We have the capacity to do it. But the problem is we live in much bigger groups than we once did, much more diverse groups. Um, uh, so once you get over 150, 200 people, um, you get uh, standard problems of collective action, free riding, tragedy of the commons. And the answer to those standard collective action problems is typically autocracy. Um, how are you going to deal with free riders? will turn over the authority to somebody to punish them, right? It's very hard, classic problem of collective action to get everybody to agree to punish, so you turn over the authority to somebody else. That's basically Hobbes, what Hobbes says. Hobbes says, look, you just have to have someone to deal with this. You need a third party enforcer. Um, so I'm going to offer a, an alternative um, uh, to try to suggest that Hobbes isn't right about that. Um, uh, and I'll start with a thought experiment. So we're not going to go to Greece right away, right? I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, a normative thought experiment. Um, so uh, imagine a place, let's call it Demopolis. Um, uh, but first, um, uh, we're going to have an ordinary human society. Um, and this society um, uh, is just uh, represented by the ordinary distribution um, uh, on that little graph. Um, and you see uh, on the uh, left side of the graph, um, uh, there are people with a very low tolerance for autocracy or tyranny, um, or one person or a few people running things. And on the right side of the graph, people have a high tolerance. They think that's fine. They're happy to have a boss. Um, and in the middle, people are, you know, well, I can, I can go either way. Um, Okay, so, uh, so that's our ordinary uh, human society. It's imagined to be diverse in every other way. Um, some liberals, some non-liberals, some religious people, some not li li religious people, some rich, some poor, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're just dividing our ordinary society according to um, uh, tolerance. Um, for autocracy. So we draw a line. Um, uh, and we're going to draw a line a little a bit to the left of the line to sort of pull out the people who are um, uh, the uh, people who don't have um, uh, a high tolerance or, uh, for 
uh, uh, autocracy. Um, so basically, we're going to um, pull out those people on that left side, um, uh, and we're going to call those the founders or the citizens of a potential state. Uh, and we're going to imagine that all the other people who are on the right side of the line are in some other state. Okay, they, they have, they have this, maybe we imagine that the society is simply divided. Uh, so maybe it's like the American Revolution, uh, in which you don't really um, go for the idea of a king. Okay, you stay here um, uh, in what's going to become the United States of America. You're okay with the idea of the king? That's fine, you go to Canada. Um, and so the society um, sort of divides. I'm sorry, I mean, Canadians, it's not, you didn't choose what your ancestors did. Yeah, you'd probably be, you know, these uh, founder citizen group. Anyway, um, okay, so uh, imagine we've got a, uh, uh, so the, the residents of Demopolis are the people to the left of that line, right? Um, and they are going to seek to create a state within a bounded territory. Um, uh, so uh, the society is ordinarily diverse in all these other social ways, right, values, economics, and so on, except that um, these people in Demopolis um, uh, uh, share a preference for non-tyranny. Um, uh, it's imagined to be some specific place, um, some place that's now and around here. This is the language of Bernard Williams, one of the great moral philosophers of the 20th century. It's not a universal. So the people who are founding Demopolis do not think they're setting up the best society for everybody everywhere. They're setting up the best society for themselves. Uh, they have this specific thing that they just don't like. Um, uh, uh, the idea of anybody um, uh, running things, one person running things, a few people running things. They recognize that there are other people who are fine with that. So they don't think that this is a universal best. It's the best for them. Um, initially, they're going to create um, uh, citizens of all the people who are culturally imaginable to them as citizens. And that's going to depend on where that now and around here is. If it's in Greece, the culturally imaginable people are going to be native males. Okay, so they're going to say, look, we're just not going to start with women because it's not culturally imaginable to them. If now and around here um, is uh, uh, in uh, uh, the 21st century in, um, uh, in Europe or the U.S., of course, women will be citizens as well. So, um, uh, so you have to imagine that everybody who can be imagined as a citizen will be a citizen to start with, but that's going to depend on where you imagine Demopolis happening. Right? Um, so it's a thought experiment. You can imagine it wherever you like. Um, OK, so uh, Demopolis and, uh, exists for three ends. Right? The first is security. Um, uh, the state has to be uh, capable of responding to shocks, hostile neighbors, environmental change. Um, it needs to be relatively robust to um, external threats, to civil conflict and subversion. It has to be able to persist over time. The residents have to feel themselves relatively secure against threats, okay? If you're not doing that, why are you bothering to set up a state in the first place? That's basically Hobbes' point. So if you, without security, it's not going to go anywhere. Furthermore, Hobbes also will say, without prosperity, at least having enough, um, uh, ample enough opportunity to gain wealth and income at levels that will allow you, as a citizen, to pursue some life plans that are other than just staying alive today or next week um, uh, or a month from now, right? So we're not saying that this society is aimed at the maximum possible prosperity. It's not, um, it's not wealth maximizing, or it might be. Some people might want to wealth maximize. But we're saying that it's not um, uh, impoverished uh, either. And once again, this is what Hobbes says, that you, why you want a state, why you want social order, because you don't want to live in miserable, desperate poverty. So you're um, uh, at fear of starvation at all times. And finally, um, uh, you're going to uh, uh, want non-tyranny. That was the, what we agreed on initially. No individual or faction is going to be allowed to rule over others as a, in a tyrannical way. Um, uh, so we're not going to have a fixed hierarchy of political power within the citizen body. The citizens will rule, um, but we won't have a hierarchy within the citizenship. So if we imagine um, the, the utility function um, of the uh, uh, median found, uh, founding citizen of Demopolis in economic language, so what a founder citizen wants, um, what they aim at, um, uh, they will want uh, several things, um, uh, and I'm sorry, the slide's a little 
um, got cut up because of the translation, I guess, from Mac to IBM. That happens from time to time. Um, at any rate, uh, diverse, freely so chosen goods. So these are things that you, uh, everybody wants to have some chance to um, uh, uh, choose some things for themselves. Political good of masterlessness in the middle, the gray. Um, and then um, uh, I, uh, want to certainly be able to survive subsistence goods uh, as, a, as a foundation. So this is, this is the, the, the general notion. What's distinct about this group is that gray area. Right? We want the political good of masterlessness, not just the, um, to do uh, other things that are important to us and stay alive. Um, so uh, various fundamentals are assumed to be grasped by our founding citizens. Um, authority, uh, they understand, is organized uh, political power, and they recognize a need for authority in their society. Legitimacy they, is uh, a general and willingness uh, uh, obedience to authority. And it requires a justification of coercive power being used by political authority. So they recognize that you need authority, you need a, 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 a legitimacy. Um, they recognize that they need rules, both for themselves now and rules that will um, be OK for future generations, will be at least potentially usable, perhaps revisable um, by future generations. They need mechanisms to enforce and amend rules. As the situation changes, we'll need to amend them. But meantime, we need to be able to enforce these rules. Um, and they recognize that any delegation of authority must be revocable. So if they decide that somebody, it would be efficient to have somebody doing a lot of the day-to-day -day business of our society, um, they recognize that that authority has to be uh, capable of being taken back by the citizens. If it can't be taken back, then that um, uh, uh, individual or group of individuals will be the boss. Um, uh, and this then requires a potential for collective action by the citizens acting jointly. They must be, have the capacity to act jointly as a demos, collectively, or whoever they've delegated to um, can use collective action problems to assure that, um, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, demos, uh, the citizens, um, uh, are in subjugation to the people who are running things. OK, so uh, Demopolis is going to set up basic rules. And I've got sort of a much longer argument about uh, why these rules um, uh, are in place. But I'll just run through them very quickly. Um, the first rule is participation. That is, all citizens must participate in the costly act of self-governance, because it costs time and effort for citizens to run themselves. Uh, it's not if you, you haven't simply delegated it off to um, a boss um, uh, permanently. Uh, it means you have to do some things yourself. Um, and so there can't be tolerance for free riders. We can't simply say that some people get, not, get the right not to pay those costs. Because if somebody's not paying the costs of um, uh, citizenship, and that same person is getting all the benefits of security and prosperity and not having a boss. We agreed we all don't want a boss. But they don't have to pay any cost of keeping the boss at bay. You know, then, well, why am I doing this work? Well, OK, fine. You're going to free ride, I'll free ride. And then pretty soon everyone's going to free ride. And then the whole thing's falling apart. So we have to, basically the rule is all participate. Second rule is uh, we have to have a way to make legislation. Um, and we have to have a way to make good legislation. We can't just make random legislation. Uh, oh, whatever rules happen to work uh, or happen to work for the moment or we happen to sort of think are sort of fun. No, they have to be good rules, rules that will allow us to compete with, for example, that autocratic society you know, on the other side of the border. Um, and this ultimately is going to require, for reasons I'll talk about briefly, political liberty, political equality, and political uh, or civic uh, dignity. It's not going to require liberalism, even though each one of those as values is associated with liberalism. These are just conditions, necessary conditions, rather than um, uh, uh, normative values. There's going to have to, some of the rules are going to have to be entrenched. That is, they're going to be hard to change. Um, uh, uh, there, it's got to be possible to change constitutional rules, but not to change them casually, because people have to be able to predict the future. 
um, reasonably well. They have to feel that they have some way to understand what's going to happen um, next week, next month, next year, so that they can make their plans accordingly, so they can invest in um, uh, long-term, uh, uh, basically, capital investments, human capital investments, social capital investments, as well as material capital. Exit, finally, is always allowed. If you think it's just too costly, I'm really sick of paying these costs. You know, I don't, you know, over there, in you know, tyrant land, you know, people don't have to do all these citizen things. Okay, we can go. Uh, so um, uh, entrance um, is going to have to be based on civic education. If you want to enter, you're going to have to be a participatory citizen, and that is, means you're going to have to actually know how to be a participatory citizen. So there's going to be some entrance uh, uh, requirements, um, and ultimately consent is going to have to be affirmative, not merely hypothetical. This is a technical matter for um, a, a, a liberal theory, um, uh, but it's a very important one. Most liberal theory can assume hypothetical um, uh, uh, consent. So the great, hugely important uh, political theory of John Rawls in his great theory of justice is all basically a way to show how you could, would create an uh, argument for hypothetical dissent, what you would consent to if you did have full information and you were a properly rational person and you weren't all muddled by all of the um, uh, uh, preferences and um, uh, partialities, if you were stripped away from all of this, this is the society that you would prefer. So you would consent to it, so that's hypothetical consent. Um, we can't do with that. We actually have to have people who are willing to say, I'll pay the cost, I'm gonna do it. I will, in fact, join in um, being a citizen with my fellow citizens. Okay, necessary conditions, political liberty, political equality, um, civic, uh, uh, political, civic dignity. Lacking any of these conditions, the state will not sustain its three ends of non-tyranny, security, and prosperity in the competitive ecology. These are um, values for some in the distribution. Some people say, hey, actually, I'm a liberal. I'm I love all of those things. I, I believe in them. Others say, actually, I'm not a liberal. I don't care about liberty as such, or equality as such, or dignity as such, but they're conditions that must be sustained if the society um, is, going to be, um, uh, is going to be sustained, uh, achieving its three ends. Uh, why is this? Well, political liberty of thought, of speech, of, of association, and this isn't every possible kind of liberty, right? It's not freedom of conscience, for example. Um, uh, it's, it's required to sustain um, uh, non-tyranny uh, non because, in the first instance, those who are unfree do have a master. So it's just a, a premise. Um, but it's also because liberty um, uh, creates conditions of prosperity through individual investments in human capital. Uh, it increases the value of specialization. Um, it promotes innovation. It gives incentives to share knowledge. Um, it ensures that those with the right kind of knowledge can seek to persuade other citizens on matters of common interest. All of these, I argue, are essential to a uh, democracy actually functioning well in a competitive environment um, with uh, uh, non-democratic regimes. Equality, once again, um, uh, it's in a sense a premise. Um, uh, it's political equality, meaning equality of voting and participation, um, uh, is required to preserve non-tyranny because those who are unequal and inferior are, by definition, subject to the mastery of the unequal and superior. Um, but furthermore, uh, equality promotes security by lowering the incentives of civil conflict. And you could just refer here to Aristotle's reasons for why democracy is more stable than oligarchy. Um, uh, basically, what Aristotle says is when there are people in your society who are imaginable as citizens, who are not citizens, they will struggle to secure citizenship, and that is systematically destabilizing. There are problems with democracy, he thinks, but this is a fundamental built-in problem with, uh, with, with, with an oligarchy. And moreover, 
um, uh, mutability that is changing environment, the fact that um, uh, the future will not be identical to uh, the present, makes it impossible for us collectively to know whose judgment will be most valuable in any future decision context. So we can say that, well, some people just don't, you know, why should we think of them as equal? Because actually their judgment isn't very good for the problems we're worried about today. But we don't know what problems we're going to be worried about tomorrow. Uh, and therefore, excluding them um, uh, from the beginning, saying, all right, you're, uh, you guys get, you don't have the right kind of judgment. You get one vote, and the rest of us really wise people get 10 votes, may, in fact, just deform things in ways uh, that we simply can't uh, address problems um, uh, in the unknowable future. OK, uh, third, dignity. Um, civic dignity as equal high standing among citizens is required because a citizen who is subject to indignity, defined as humiliation or infantilization, whether that's by a state official or some powerful individual, is just not functionally free or equal. Those, if you are subject to indignity, you, every time you go out in public, imagine, you expect that people are going to subject you to humiliation. Um, uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, you're, you're free, sure, you scum. Um, and that is, you know, systematic, you know. Uh, uh, or they say, oh, well, do speak up in our meeting, you silly little child. We love it when we have a little childish break in our discussions. You know, at that point, you are not being treated um, uh, as truly free or equal. You're going to silence yourself, probably. Um, uh, this is the basic problem that the, uh, Ralph Ellison's brilliant novel, Invisible Man, um, uh, talks about. Uh, and furthermore, um, uh, dignity uh, moderates um, uh, various tendencies once we actually start thinking about distribution questions and justice, um, uh, moderates tendencies towards ultra-libertarian and ultra-egalitarian approaches to social justice for reasons I could talk about, but we don't have time here. All right, so uh, uh, legitimacy. Um, uh, like any government, Demopolis must address what Williams called the basic legitimacy demand, and that is just how does coercive authority, can it be justified to those who are subject to that coercive authority without mystification, without telling lies, and without resort to mere force? We'll beat you up if you don't obey. Okay, so what... What Williams, I think, rightly says is that every uh, regime um, that one would want to consider, a decent regime, um, is going to have to meet this basic demand. Furthermore, a participatory democracy has a secondary legitimacy demand, and that is it must answer the question, how is the duty to pay the relatively high costs of political participation to be justified to the citizens, right? So we, the founders, agree that we're going to pay those costs, but how do we justify that to the next generation? How do we justify it to the immigrant um, who might come in here? What is the argument for why paying those costs um, uh, is actually uh, uh, the right thing to do? So we have to have a civic education then within Demopolis um, uh, that uh, addresses issues of motivation. Um, that is, we can uh, uh, the costs of uh, democratic participation can be justified if we can show that participation brings benefits that are not available to non-participants. So say, here's the argument: by participating, you get things that no non-participant Participation in itself brings you benefits, and therefore um, uh, it covers the costs. So my claim is, and once again, it's a longer argument, that democracy uniquely offers citizens the opportunity freely to exercise certain natural human capacities of using reason and using communication. The idea is these are natural capacities of ordinary, healthy humans to so pro-social ends, the idea is that humans are by nature social beings, in making judgments, that is making, helping to make decisions about really important things uh, of common interest like prosperity, like security, like if we agree on that, non-tyranny. Okay, so the ultimate claim then is that um, uh, in this diagram, uh, the democratic citizen um, who has to spend this gray box time on participation duties um, uh, in the uh, diagram on the left 
um, uh, will in fact um, have as much aggregate utility um, uh, as the person on the right, uh, or more so. So uh, the subject of a benevolent tyrant has more time in the premise to spend on diverse and freely chosen goods, but um, the uh, democratic uh, citizen um, gains from the time that is spent on participation duties. There are actual benefits coming from that. That's not just a cost. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this slide. Um, uh, it is an argument about um, terminology about Greek regimes. Um, uh, and the upshot of it uh, is to claim that democracy in ancient Greek, demokratia, um, demos and kratos, um, did not originally mean majority tyranny. Um, so it, in fact, so, so they, when the Demos didn't mean the majority who happened to be poor and in power, for, set, for example, um, have the capacity to dominate, to tyrannize over the minority, right? So that's what Hobbes says democracy should mean. That's what many people have thought democracy means. It didn't mean that in uh, ancient Greek, if the argument that this graph is meant to capture uh, goes through. Rather, it meant uh, the demos, the whole of the citizen body, has the capacity to do things together. It has the capacity to engage in action. Okay, so that's the, the kratos then means capacity to do things. It means power to, not power over. Um, demos means all of us citizens, not the majority of us um, who happen to have some subsidiary interest in common, like the poor or something like that. Okay, so if that argument goes through, um, and I can give you a, a reference uh, uh, to work that uh, uh, lays it out in more detail, then we begin to go back to ancient Greece and connect it to our thought experiment. Because the mature Athenian definition of democracy is, I claim, collective self-governance by citizens, which is limited by certain constitutional rules of law in order to sustain the goods of non-tyranny and security and prosperity. By the um, early fourth century BC, this is how a Greek who was in favor of democracy thought about it when they said the word demokratia. That would be the basic set of ideas in your head. The demopolis definition that I've been developing here, collective and limited self-governance by an extensive and diverse body of well-motivated, capable citizens aimed at achieving and sustaining the ends of non-tyranny, security, and prosperity. So the idea is the reality of the historical development of Athens ends up in the same place that the thought experiment ended up. And if I haven't created the thought experiment in some perverse way, right, if the premises are fair and the way I've worked it out is fair, and if I've understood Athenian history in the right way, so these, then um, uh, we have uh, a, um, a theoretical argument that um, uh, confirms um, a certain way of understanding Athenian history and vice versa. Why bother? Because, for example, um, of the problem of delegated versus direct democracy. Now, Athens was in many ways a direct democracy, famously. Um, uh, citizens legislate, they make rules, they adjudicate, they judge according to those rules, and they engage in police actions. They enforce the rules, right? And they do this pretty much as a citizenry, right? So the demos has the capacity to do those things collectively. Um, uh, Athens shows that uh, direct democracy is sustainable. It achieves security and prosperity without liberalism in a society that's too big to be face to face and thus faces, um, uh, does face collective action problems. So Athens isn't a tiny little uh, society with a few dozen people. It's a society of uh, at least hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and so it is an out of sample test of the feasibility of direct democracy at least well over face-to-face -face scale. So we could have got that, but you will say, all very fine and well, but no modern state is a direct democracy. And this is in part because much greater scale um, of modern states makes it implausible to be so. Several hundred thousand people is all very fine and well. Several hundred million people is a whole different kettle of fish. 
Uh, right? So um, it makes it uh, uh, perhaps impossible that a modern democracy could employ an Athens-like government at least day to day. So why bother with Athens? Why bother with Demopolis? Um, why not just say, look, Hobbes had it right. Let's get on with it. Um, the answer is the problem of elite capture. If an elite can capture authority, then democratic equilibrium fails, right? That's the premise. Um, uh, then we won't have an equilibrium. We will have um, a boss. It'll be that elite. Um, it's the basic assumptions that we go forward with. Democratic citizens, I have suggested, and this is why I do that whole um, Demopolis experiment. Democratic uh, citizens are willing to pay some costs to preserve democracy because those costs are repaid by genuine benefits. Um, but citizens also require opportunities to pursue individual goods. If the costs of running this thing run up, so the gray box just takes over that black box, right? You're going to say, it's just too much. You know, I have other things I want to do with my, in my life than be a citizen. Um, and therefore, in a large, complex state, this means at least there's going to be some delegation of authority. We just don't have time um, to run a society of millions of people by millions of people. We're going to have to delegate. Okay, that's an assumption. Um, uh, the other assumption, then, uh, is the, del is the, is the uh, demos may delegate authority to make rules, for example, appoint legislative uh, 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 representatives, a parliament or a senate, a congress, um, president, uh, and to enforce those rules, police, a professionalized judiciary. But in order to prevent elite capture of the system, by definition, tyranny, delegation of authority must be conditional and revocable. Right? You have to be able to take it back from those guys to whom it has been delegated, because otherwise they are the boss. If you say they basically realize, oh, well, you can never take it back, um, uh, then they can pretty much do what they want. To be revocable in practice, the citizens must be capable of making rules and enforcing rules. They have to have this capacity that was at the core of the Greek idea of what democratia meant. So this is sort of a, uh, went by quickly. Let's do a little game. Um, so uh, delegation game, um, at the start of the game, and this is just basic game theory. So uh, uh, this is meant to show how game theory can um, help us think about some things between you know, uh, uh, positive and uh, uh, normative uh, theory. So uh, in, at, at the start of the game, we have a delegated democracy. Representatives are legislating, police are enforcing rules. The demos elects its delegates, its representatives. Somehow it names the uh, 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 judiciary um, and uh, monitors their performance, keeps an eye on how things are going. So we start out with representatives or the police. And I'm just going to say representatives because it's too messy to say representatives and police. So OK, players in the games are the representatives, um, the demos, and then nature. By nature, I don't mean flowers and fish and so on. Um, I mean the background conditions um, that have brought the demos to have a certain type. And the type we're going to be concerned with is either capable or incapable. So that's, we're going to say that either we had a history, um, things happened in the past that made the demos either a highly capable um, uh, demos, capable of collective action, or, or incapable. OK, so, uh, and we're going to put the outcomes to this game in, in boldface. So um, the police, uh, when we start the game, once again, highly stylized. You know, this is, uh, 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 is not any particular world, right? This is the way to think about um, uh, uh, the problem. Uh, the uh, uh, representatives have to decide, should we violate um, uh, the trust in which the demos have placed in us, uh, uh, or should we um, uh, not delegate, or we not violate? Not do and if they don't violate, the game is over. Um, we get delegated democracy, you know, everything stays. So, okay, so that's, 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 that's a quick end to the game. Um, but what if, they what if they do violate? What if they get together and say, you know, it would be more fun for us um, uh, to simply run this place for our own interest? Uh, it would be more fun not to listen so much to the demos. Let's just say there would be some real advantages um, to listening more to the people who give us most of the money um, uh, by which we are elected. Um, I know that seems absolutely impossible in the modern world, but believe me, some people have suggested it's conceivable. Um, uh, so perhaps they decide to violate. So now the demos has to decide 
itself whether to revoke or not revoke. If they decide, having observed violation, oh, they're not, they're not working for us anymore. They're working for these rich guys who give them the money to be reelected. Um, uh, but, oh well, you know, that's okay. Um, so basically that means the game is over. Now we have tyranny. Those guys are running things. Um, uh, or at least we have, we're on the slippery slope towards tyranny. Um, uh, and then uh, the third move of the game is going to be by nature, um, uh, uh, which is going to decide whether um, in the background there was a capable demos, um, uh, one that could act together collectively, um, uh, and uh, whether there is an incapable demos. And the two possibilities uh, you'll see are going to be we're going to end up either at direct democracy um, or uh, hob state of nature. So we have four possible outcomes, delegated democracy, that is the status quo, tyranny, direct democracy, or the state of nature. The preference orderings of our players are um, uh, listed here. Nature doesn't have any preference orderings. Nature is just nature, you know, it's just, just whatever happened. Um, uh, so the representatives would like tyranny because then they get better rents, they get to do well. Um, uh, after that, delegated democracy, that's okay, they're doing all right, they have some power, some influence, and so on. Direct democracy, well, they just got put out of a job, they don't like that so well, but after all, they're citizens, they get something. The state of nature is very bad. Um, uh, it's miserable, it's insecure. For all the reasons that Hobbes pointed out, they don't like that. The demos likes delegated democracy, um, uh, uh, but it also likes direct democracy because uh, of reasons we'll go into. They don't like tyranny at all. We agreed that they don't like tyranny at the beginning. At least this is Demopolis, but they really don't like state of nature. So tyranny is better than the state of nature. Okay. Um, you'll notice that the demos is indifferent between delegated and direct democracy. That's going to make my life a little easier in setting up this game. It doesn't really matter as long as the demos um, uh, uh, likes uh, a direct democracy more than it likes tyranny. Um, uh, it's all right. So that, that the number five uh, in direct democracy there in red could be uh, anywhere between um, uh, uh, one and five. Um, okay, uh, uh, the idea of indifference here um, uh, is that uh, the citizens in a direct democracy um, uh, and the citizens in a delegated democracy are getting similar kind of utility payoffs, right? So um, in a direct democracy, they're getting more political goods. We already said they were getting a nice payoff for that, but they still have some chance for individually chosen goods. Um, and in a delegated democracy, they have fewer of these kind of participatory goods, um, but it's a wash for them. So. Once again, that's just a premise that makes my life a little easier. It's not a necessary premise of the game. Um, okay, the delegation uh, has different <laughs> solutions. If the demos is incapable, um, and both the demos and the representative play on path, that is, they act the way they're supposed to, according to fully rational, um, fully informed players, then we'll end up at tyranny. If the demos is capable, and both representatives and demos play on path, we'll end up at delegated democracy. If the demos is capable and uh, the representatives make a mistake and they think, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll just try it, um, we're gonna end up at direct democracy. And if the demos is incapable and play, pays off path, we're gonna end up in the state of nature. Um, and these are just the payoffs. The first payoff is to the representative, the second payoff um, uh, is to the demos. All right, here's how this works. Um, so suppose the demos is incapable. Um, uh, the equilibrium path, which is in green, um, is uh, that uh, the representatives, uh, looking um, down the game tree at an incapable demos, um, knows that the incapable demos, looking down the uh, game tree, uh, will actually prefer uh, to not revoke um, uh, when the uh, representatives violate um, uh, because they prefer um, uh, uh, tyranny um, uh, to the state of nature. So the um, representatives are free to violate, and they will, right? Um, uh, so incapable demos just leaves us with a single equilibrium path um, and a single outcome uh, that is in tyranny. If everybody plays according to uh, uh, their best move in the game, that the best move in the game is the highest payoff, given these, these uh, 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 payoffs that are, that are listed at the bottom. 
Um, so uh, if the Deimos is capable and the equilibrium path is not violated, then the outcome is going to be delegated democracy. Um, in this case, um, uh, the uh, capable Deimos um, is perfectly willing to revoke um, uh, if uh, the representatives uh, ever violate. Um, the representatives know that because it's a full information game, um, uh, and they uh, would much prefer to be in um, uh, a, a delegated democracy than a direct democracy. Well, they'll end up um, uh, if, they, uh, if they violate, and therefore um, they don't uh, violate. And so, once again, the equilibrium path uh, leads to an outcome, um, in this case, the delegated democracy outcome. Now, what if the um, representatives just say, let's try it? You know, well, maybe we're not sure whether they're capable or not. You know, we're just, we're just vague on that. Or maybe they're capable, but they don't realize their own capacity. Or maybe they're lazy, or whatever that is. They, uh, so let's just try it. What happens? Uh, so then uh, the representatives violate. Um, the demos says, well, I'm a capable demos. Um, uh, I'm going to revoke. Um, uh, and the capable demos then takes over and legislates. Um, and we end up at uh, a direct uh, democracy. So um, uh, that is. Uh, uh, the outcome with one um, uh, party going off path. Um, suppose the demos is incapable. Um, uh, it's not kept to collective action. Um, uh, but uh, the representatives then logically say, incapable demos, our best move is violate, uh, to violate. The demos says, oh, but actually I think I'm capable. Um, I think we can do this. Um, but they actually can't. Um, uh, they can't run things themselves, so they uh, overthrow the uh, uh, representatives, um, and they find themselves then in a, a state of anarchy uh, or in the state of nature, and so it's a, a very bad uh, outcome. So the conclusion on delegation is that basic democracy is preserved under conditions of delegation only when delegated authority can be revoked and can be revoked at an acceptable cost um, to the citizens. And this requires a demos that is capable of ruling, that is making and enforcing rules, directly through joint action of many interdependent individuals in a mutable, changeable environment. Now, dem uh, basic democracy does not require that democracy is always direct. Um, uh, it does require that direct democracy is always a live option. So the kind of democracy I'm thinking of here, democracy before liberalism, does not allow for an incapable demos. It will end up in tyranny. OK. Um, uh, civic education, therefore, is the key to the story. Um, the key to the story is Plato thought it was the key to the story. Aristotle thought it was the key to the story. Rousseau thought it was the key to the story. It turns out to be the key to the story. Um, but it's a key for somewhat different reasons than these other thinkers said. If basic democracy is to be a legitimate, education must be about justification. It must be about giving potential citizens good reasons why they might prefer um, uh, uh, democracy over tyranny and why they should pay the costs of participation. But if basic democracy is to be stable, Education must also be about capability. Um, it must be about common knowledge of bright line rules, about procedural mechanisms, about when and how to revoke delegated authority, and how to work the machine of direct democracy. So the question before us then be, is, what background rules, what mechanisms would enable many individual citizens to address the demands of an inter dependent, you know, we depend on each other, we're social animals, um, uh, it, it allow us to um, uh, do this in a mutable environment through at least occasional acts of direct legislation or enforcement. If they violate, then we revoke, and that may happen on an occasional basis. How would that be really possible? And this is why I think looking at Greek history is so important. Because uh, it gives us the way in to think about mechanism design for um, uh, allowing a mass of citizens to do business. So I'm basically not going to do most of the rest of the slides because it's going to take up too much time. Um, uh, I have two articles that I've talked about this recently, um, uh, Democracy's Wisdom uh, and Democracy's Dignity, which lay out the arguments um, for how we can think through uh, ancient mechanisms of 
democratic design to answer the problem um, of uh, a violation and delegation um, and how a uh, collectivity can actually do business at least on an occasional basis. The first basic question is about legislation. So how do we answer an issue that has multiple factors and we have multiple decision makers? We have some established uh, decision mechanism and we have multiple options. So again, this is, an, and this is a problem that Aristotle addressed. It's a problem that the Greeks addressed. And by thinking through both Greek political theory, I think especially certain passages of Aristotle, and thinking about Athenian mechanisms, we can actually learn a lot about how that was done and think about how that could be adapted um, to an occasional intervention by a modern demos. Um, so these are just uh, about how that works. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to keep you here all day. Um, uh, 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 the other uh, uh, argument um, that I have to make is about the essential um, uh, feature of dignity uh, that I talked about, civic dignity. Um, how can um, citizens uh, join together to stop these kind of unpleasant conditions in which people are um, uh, having to suffer humiliation or, or being treated um, in an infantilized uh, form. Um, uh, and the basic uh, argument that I've already suggested for you is that democracy requires civic dignity in order for this to work. Citizens who suffer humiliation um, uh, are not really free, nor are they really uh, equal. Um, uh, if you have civic dignity, um, uh, uh, it is possible that, uh, to maintain it in ways um, that are uh, robust. Um, uh, if the defense of dignity is the collective responsibility of the citizens, um, uh, and if democratic institutions provide mechanisms and incentives for officials and ordinary citizens to defend people, when their dignity has been violated, right? When some public official or some powerful official starts treating uh, a citizen um, uh, in ways that are inappropriate. And once again, in an ideal world, I would work through this first little simple game to show you why um, uh, in a democratic system and in an Athenian system, um, the uh, outcome of this simple little two-player game where we have number one being someone who'd like to violate and number two, someone who has to choose whether to defend or uh, to ignore the violation will end up being where the red line goes, that is to dignity being respected. And I can show you in a much more extensive game um, how when we add a formal institution into it, um, the uh, a court, um, uh, we can um, uh, once again end up with dignity um, being respected uh, and indeed uh, a initially um, arrogant uh, elite um, uh, receiving a reasonable payoff in terms of honor, um, uh, even if it's not his perfect uh, payoff. So these are simply ways to urge you to think about um, uh, getting involved with reading uh, and thinking about designing literature um, that could um, uh, uh, begin to address these questions that are both normative, right, dignity, and they are positive. How can we create um, uh, something like uh, a dignity in um, uh, equilibrium? And by way of conclusions, Athenian direct democracy um, uh, offers us approaches um, to legislation, making rules, and enforcing rules by citizens that could be adapted by a modern democracy, not as a complete replacement for delegated authority, but as a supplement to it so that our representatives always know that if they violate, we can, in fact, do something else. We can do it ourselves. Um, one way to think about this would be the citizen referendum. Uh, citizen referendums have very bad reputations in the modern world. Um, is that because it's a terrible idea inherently that the citizens should decide on matters of great interest? No, it's the citizen referendums are very badly done. Um, they're badly designed. Um, they're easily captured by elites. Uh, they basically are subject to a lot of um, uh, uh, perverse uh, uh, results. Um, but uh, uh, through improved mechanisms, um, which I think we can begin to think about by thinking through um, uh, uh, ancient Greek history and political thought, um, I think it's way 
way, there are ways to think about how we could actually improve uh, modern uh, citizen referendums, especially uh, in an age of modern technology. Um, and then in terms of how do we enforce um, uh, the rules, how do we actually, as it were, ser see, uh, serve as, at least in some conditions, the police, um, once again, I think this is uh, quite conceivable um, through the generalization, um, through the right kind of education of norms of responsibility. Uh, so there's already currently a lot of discussion about the whole question about bystander witnesses um, to inappropriate acts of various sorts. If you see somebody um, uh, uh, suffering um, uh, uh, some kind of a sexual violation, for instance, do you just sort of stand there and say, Gosh, that's a pity that that's happening. Oh, boy. Um, uh, you know, I really have to go study for that test. Do you say, all right, the only thing I can possibly do is call 911 and hope that the authorities come in? Or do you do something about it? Do you expect your fellow citizens to do something about it? Well, increasingly, um, at least various communities are saying, we ought to expect citizens to do something about it. Uh, once again, these things go easily wrong when, when, when badly organized. But there's no reason that they have to be badly organized. And thinking through um, Greek history and Greek political thought gives us some ways uh, to think of how that might work. Well, that's it. I just want to thank the Leventis Foundation once again for making all of this possible. And I'm not going to read all of the other names above people at institutions that I ought to be thanking. Um, uh, but uh, none of the work that I've been doing, none of the work um, that uh, we're going to be doing over the course of the next three days would be possible um, without the contributions um, of a lot of organizations and a lot of people. So I want to give them all collective thanks. Thank you for being here um, and thank uh, my fellow participants in this conference. I'm looking forward for, to now standing down from this podium um, and learning um, from all of you uh, over the next uh, several days. So my thanks. Thank you.